Welcome everyone, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors at The Way and we're in week four of a vision series. And one of the images we've used to describe what we're doing with this series is that of a boat, that we're all in a boat together, learning to paddle in the same direction. And so in week one, we talked about becoming a people of prayer. In week two, we talked about being an empowered community. On week three, last week, I shared about our desire to reach people and share the good news of Jesus with others. And in week four, we're talking about becoming a radically generous people. That's what today is about. That's the big idea. Being a generous people who are building a radically generous church that impacts this city, the nation, and the world in a way that is profound and practical, in a way that helps and doesn't hurt, in a way that empowers and uplifts and makes an eternal difference. That's what we're talking about today. And later on, this is a two-part message. Later on, Jason is going to share about what this looks like for our church. And he's got all of these alliterations, and so look forward to that. I'm talking time, treasure, talents, all of that, so you know it's going to be good. But part of this this journey we're all on, this journey of following Jesus, is really letting his ethic invade every area of our lives, our relationships, our dreams, our vocation, and even our money. All throughout scripture, the Bible talks about money and wealth. Jesus talks about money way more than we're comfortable with, way more than I'm comfortable with. He talks about money more than eternal life, okay? In in 11 of 39 of his parables, these stories he tells about the kingdom of God, he mentions wealth. So he talks about it a lot. And I know out of the gate how triggering this conversation can be for us. It's a struggle, right? Like we, we, we've nursed secret suspicions in our hearts that, that the, you know, the church is after our money. We've, you know, we've seen appeals being made in manipulative ways. We've, we've you know, seen funds mismanaged. We felt like An exclusive focus on finances ignores all the other beautiful ways we can give. I mean, on and on I can go. There are so many landmines in this conversation. But look, we want to be a generous people building a radically generous church. And so we need to talk about money and wealth and giving because Jesus did. And we need to do it in a way that's nuanced and balanced and grace-filled and loving and joyful, especially in a season like this. And so what I want to do is unpack a biblical vision for generosity. And I have four points. And here's the first one. Generosity acknowledges that everything ultimately belongs to God. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, uh, The earth is the Lord's, And everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And so the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And this idea is crucial to understanding the concept of stewardship. That a steward is someone who manages the wealth of another. And so we tend to think naturally that we're owners But the Bible would say, no, 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 we're stewards. We look after what ultimately belongs to God because the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Which means the question is never, what should I do with my wealth? It is instead, how can I best steward God's wealth? The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The question's not, you know, you know, God's asking me to give some of my wealth. Instead, it's always, no, God is allowing me to keep some of his because the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. And I've sometimes used this silly illustration to kind of tease out the logic that, that's underneath this idea of giving. I have two kids, Caden and Mila. Caden's 10, Mila's 7. And I used to always take them to Superstore. And one of the reasons is because Superstore, their bakery there, gives out free cookies to kids. They do not give cookies to adults. I think it's a form 
of ageism or something. And so they just give it to kids. And so I would teach my kids the principle of generosity, of measured giving. And I would say to them, give me a bite of your cookie. And my favorite response they gave, and every parent and grandparent and guardian and babysitter or whatever, like you'll, you'll sympathize with this. I would say, give me a bite of your cookie. And my favorite response was, no, it's mine. I will not share it. It is mine. And in those moments, I would respond to them and I'd you know, get down on their level and, and look them in the eye and I would say something like, if it wasn't for your mom and me a little bit, you wouldn't have life or breath or clothes or cookies, right? They won't even give you this cookie unless I'm here with you. Like acknowledge that fact and that reality by giving me a bit of the cookie. And it's a silly illustration, but in part it, it explains this logic of giving that yeah, we work for our money and we labor and we strive and we toil to make ends meet. But the Bible reminds us that we only labor and toil and strive with the strength, breath, and existence that God provides as an unearned gift. That every breath is borrowed. It's on loan from him. It all belongs to God and returns to God. And apart from God, we wouldn't have anything at all. And so giving and generosity and Funneling resources towards things that matter to God is a continual reminder that we're stewards, not owners, because everything belongs to God. Point two, generosity is meant to be an act of joy and gratitude. The Apostle Paul writes to a church in the city of Corinth in the first century a couple letters. And in the second letter, he makes an appeal for funds from the church. And the context is he's raising funds for churches in another region of the Roman Empire that are suffering under a famine. And he writes a lot of things. You should read chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, but I'll just read to you chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, where he writes this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so he starts by saying, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. It's this agrarian principle he ties to giving. It's kind of like you reap what you sow, that type of idea. And elsewhere, he reminds the Corinthians that in giving, they will be enriched in every way. To be clear, this is not affirming an idea called the prosperity gospel, which teaches, you know, if you follow Jesus and you believe enough and you give enough, God will make you healthy and wealthy. God's will didn't work out that way for Jesus or the first disciples, and it probably won't work out that way for us. There's certainly no divine guarantee. Right? The prosperity gospel is actually a false gospel. It's a gross distortion of biblical doctrine that's baptized the false gods of materialism and consumerism. That being said, God does promise that generosity brings blessing with it. And that blessing sometimes involves greater material prosperity, which can lead to even more generosity and resources being given to kingdom purposes. But the focus here is not what we get back, it's what we give. We are sowing into the lives of other people and the impact of our generosity in their lives is really the harvest that we are reaping and celebrating. And then he goes on to say this, he says, each of us must give as he has decided in his heart to give. I love this. In partnership with God. In conversation with God, we decide in our hearts what we want to give. We make a decision in advance about what we want to give, right? In other words, we make a plan. And so one of my friends gives a percentage of every paycheck he gets, but then he's decided in advance that any unexpected funds that come in, he will give half of that away. That's his plan. It's different than mine, but we have one. 
And I found the greatest way to get money out of my heart is to give it out of my hands. I want money to be my servant, not my master. So to get it out of my heart, I give it out of my hands. But that takes a plan. And there's no percentage on the plan, but we make one because it's a privilege to give. We make a plan so that we don't feel external pressure. It's like when we, when we don't decide in our hearts what we will give, it can lead to this reluctance. It can lead to a feeling of compulsion, right? When we don't have a plan, it can feel like other people are putting pressure on us. And we have a plan for plenty and a plan for when times are tight. And making a plan and deciding in our hearts in advance what we will give allows us to join in on what God is doing and partner with God in a way that brings not reluctance, but delight and joy. After all, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. That giving is meant to be a delight, not a duty. And so I'll give this illustration, especially for the ladies here. Imagine your best friend's boyfriend has a friend visiting from out of town and your friend invites you to come out on a double date with her, her boyfriend, and his friend from out of town. So it's a blind double date for you ladies, okay? And so with a bit of trepidation, you, you agree to the date out of duty to your friend. There's reluctance involved. You're, you're not sure you want to go. There's a sense of compulsion, right? Like they, they say to you, I would do it for you. And you feel it's like a little manipulative, but you agree because it's your friend. And then you meet the guy and you're immediately smitten. He's amazing. He has a job. He loves God. His clothes match. Personal hygiene seems on point. From then on, you never need to be asked to take him out again. You want to date him. No one could stop you. No reluctance, no compulsion. It's cheerful. It's joyful. Some translations translate that word like hilarious. There's a hilarity to it. Like you're all in. What started as a duty gets transformed into delight within the context of relationship. And that's what God wants for all of us when it comes to generosity. In the context of relationship and partnership with God, who he is and what he's done Duty gives way to delight. Like have to gets transformed into want to. Legalism gets left for the dead in the wake of genuine love. How amazing is it that we get to give back to you, God? It's all from you. It's all for you. No reluctance, no compulsion. It is a joy. Generosity is meant to be a joyful thing. Number three, Generosity reveals and reinforces where our treasure truly is found. Jesus has this very well-known piece of teaching from the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. And there he says these words, listen to this. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying that treasure on earth is so vulnerable and transient. It can be gone in a moment. It doesn't last. It can be stolen. It can rot away. It can be taken due to circumstances outside of your control. It leads to this sense of vulnerability. And that can give birth to fear and anxiety. What if I lose this? Or it can lead to a, a closed-fisted life. I can't lose this. Treasure on earth is vulnerable, Jesus says. And he says it doesn't last. It doesn't last. A couple times a year, I go to the dump. And this idea hits me like a ton of bricks as I throw out things that were one time at one point, you know, new. And I realized that, you know, most of what I buy is destined for the dump. I live in a neighborhood, East Van, where all around me, old houses are being torn down and they're putting up duplexes. And a landfill 
or a demolition site is a sobering reminder of what will ultimately matter. And it's not the stuff we buy or the possessions that we accumulate over a lifetime. It's not the house we own or our standard of living. It's really our level of giving to others. And that giving is more than wealth. It is more than wealth, but it is not less. To say it another way, what matters most is faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love expressed to God and others. That we don't love money and use people and God to get more of it. We love God and people and use money to further those ends. And when we invest in God's kingdom and others, we're investing in something that can last for eternity and that also changes us beautifully in the present. Because I really believe that when we invest in God's kingdom through missions and local church and ministries that serve and empower the poor or some other NGO, the more our heart is actually invested in things that matter to God. And the more we're invested in things that reflect the heart of God, the more our lives will naturally begin to reflect the heart of God. And listen, the best way to not end up as an older person filled with regrets is to allow what will matter at the end of your life matter in the middle of your life. And when I invest in the kingdom of God and others, I am allowing what will matter at the end of my life and in eternity impact and shape the middle of my life. And as my days lengthen, my joy and you know, gratitude can increase. Think about this. If your treasure is in heaven and you believe that, each day you live brings you a step closer to your treasure, which means each day you live, your joy can increase. If your treasure is on earth, Each day you live brings you a step closer to losing your treasure. And each day you live, your joy should decrease. It's two radically different ways of living. When I invest in the kingdom of God and others, I am letting what will matter at the end of my life matter in the middle of my life. And as days go by, my joy and gratitude can increase. Now here's point four. Last point. Uh, Generosity is an expression of the gospel. And so again, when the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he's asking them to give to those in need, he doesn't mention the Old Testament tithe. He doesn't, you know, draw a thermometer on the wall uh, with a fundraising goal. Nothing wrong with that, but he doesn't do it. Uh, Instead, he writes these words. Listen to this. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. This is why we're talking about radical generosity. The root of radical is actually, you know, it means root actually. It means back to the, the beginning. And if you go back to the root of the Jesus movement, you encounter the radical generosity of God in Jesus. I mean, think about Jesus. Think about the grace and kindness and love of Jesus. He left the riches of heaven for the poverty of earth to make you and I his treasure. In one of his parables, his stories He likens the kingdom of God to a treasure buried in a field that a man gives up everything to purchase. Getting involved in what God is doing in the world is that valuable. You give up everything to be a part of it. But let me just flip that parable as some commentators have done. There was a treasure buried in the field of the world that Jesus gave everything to purchase for himself. And that treasure was you and I. And we didn't earn it, and we didn't deserve it, and it was all a gift of grace. And because God has been gracious and generous to us in our spiritual poverty, and because God has met our deepest need to be forgiven and reconciled to him, will he not also meet our material needs as he defines them? And should we not also reflect his generosity in our relationship with others. You know the grace 
of the Lord Jesus, right? The gospel applied to our finances always leads to radical generosity and open-handedness towards others. And we're most like Jesus when we're giving to others through time, our words, our energy, or our finances. So I'll end with these two stories. One comes from the Gospel of Mark. It's Jesus, and he's sitting at the temple, and he's watching people give to the temple. And this is what Scripture says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in and watched the crowd, you know, putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, look at this, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. She's put more into the treasury. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. It's clear from this story that to Jesus, more has nothing to do with amount. Technically, the rich gave more money than the poor widow, but not in Jesus' eyes. He says, she has given more because more is not about the amount of money. It's about the amount of love and the amount of trust and the amount of sacrifice represented by the act of giving. And again, you can't put a percentage on that. The more that matters to Jesus has nothing to do with amount unless we're talking about the amount of love and the amount of trust expressed in the giving like the widow. Our church is given to other organizations. And we're connected to Promise, a ministry that provides support for families living on the downtown east side. They do summer camps and after school care. And it's a beautiful the way they empower and embrace youth and support families. Graham and Olivia from our church work there. And I went to one of their fundraisers and Graham was sharing, this was so beautiful, Graham was sharing with the seven-year-old boy the vision of the night, why they were raising funds. And the boy had come early to the event with his family because he's part of the after-school program. And as he listened to the purpose of the night, his eyes lit up. And when Graham was done explaining, he ran to his bag and emptied out all of his change and gave it up freely to support the ministry. It's like so beautiful, so significant. Because significance is not about the size of the gift, It's about the, you know, the amount of trust and the amount of love it expresses. It's about partnering with God in our finances. And partnering could start with pennies. And so I'll leave you with that picture, right? No compulsion, no reluctance, so much joy, so much spontaneity. And I thought when I heard that story, I want to be like that kid when I grow up. And so before we transition to what Jason will share, I want to take a moment and pray for us. I know that this conversation can be challenging and triggering for some of us. It feels like a pressure point or even a pain point in our lives for all kinds of reasons. And I'm so sympathetic to that. And so I want to pray together before we transition. Let's pray. Father, first I just want to acknowledge that your word is true. And we want to live under its authority. We want to embrace the way of Jesus as a community. But we acknowledge that that's not always easy. And I want to pray first for those who feel, especially when they hear a message like this, that they don't have enough. And they're scared about making ends meet. And this feels like a very even threatening message to their sense of of security. God, I pray for that person right now, first that they would know your presence and the comfort of your Holy Spirit. And that they would know your love And with that would come a sense that you're holding them 
and you will provide for them. May they know you in this season as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. May they see that in practical and tangible ways, even this next week. And I pray you'd speak to them, just like in the story of the widow, what is the next step they can take on this journey of partnering with you? I just pray that there would be a created space for them to hear you in this area of their lives and that faith would increase and trust would increase as you provide for them. You're so faithful. God, I also want to pray for those who have plenty and who have almost a special grace on their lives in the area of of making money and generosity. I just pray for an increase in their lives as well, more faith, more vision for how you've graced them to invest and sow into the lives of people in this city, in this church, in this country, and around the world. God, I thank you uh, for those who you've given plenty to and who are stewarding it with with, uh, a joy in their hearts and also just a reverence for you, God. I just pray for wisdom and grace for them. And as a church, God, I want to pray lastly that that we would become a generous people, a radically generous people, that we would funnel as a people over the years millions of dollars into this city, into our country, into our world, not in a way that hurts, but in a way that helps and empowers and makes a practical difference and that people would know that we love this city and that we're for this city and we wanna see all people in the city flourish and experience the abundant goodness of our God. And we pray all of those things in the awesome mighty name of Jesus, amen. Well, let me just start by saying how much I love team teaching with Chris. I mean, we weren't side by side because of restrictions. In a different world, we would have been side by side doing this. But I love prepping this content. And part of it is because this isn't just something that Chris is good at talking about. It's something he actually lives into. And so the reality as a pastor, and this whole vision series has done this, is when we're prepping these talks on prayer or prepping these talks on community or evangelism or giving, like it is deeply convicting because we're not always living into these things to the degree to which we feel like God is calling us as a church to go after. And so as we present these ideas today, know that this is working on my heart and it's led to conversations in my home about what would it look like to let this message of generosity steep into every part of my heart. So I'm up here to correct any mistakes that Chris made, to do some cleanup work. No, no, I'm just kidding. I just want to give a few thoughts of response to Chris's message. And really, I want to do three things. I want to give you two frameworks. And there's great alliteration that Chris already mentioned in those two frameworks. The first is three T's. The second is three W's. So it'll be easy to remember. So two frameworks. And then I want to talk about four things this means for the Way Church, like four ways this will be expressed at the Way Church. First framework, three T's. But before I tell you the T's, let me tell you what this framework is about. And it's about this, that any conversation about generosity as a response to the gospel has to include more than just money. And I think it was really important that we zeroed in on this theme of finance because it's deeply nuanced and integrated into our hearts and lives. But man, it's gotta be bigger than that. Any conversation about generosity must speak to our whole lives. Like our whole lives are a response to what God has done. And here's the reality. It's possibly generous with money, but stingy with our words of encouragement. It's possibly generous with wealth, but stingy with our time and relationships. It's possibly generous in one area, but the gospel wants to work its way into every area of our life. And so I was talking to my friend, uh, Lawrence, who's part of our church, about this, and he gave me a framework that was so helpful. He said, when it comes to generosity, we're talking about time, talent, and treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. Time. Time is incredibly precious and powerful. We can't create more time. Time is like a fixed resource. And so when you give a person your time, when you serve and volunteer for an organization or a local church, it is a precious gift and it's an act of worship. And it's one of the ways that we respond with generosity. When you open your life to a friend who's grieving and you sit with them, it's radical generosity. When you walk with someone 
through life, generosity. When you open up your time, you give away your time to listen, to serve, whatever it might be, that's generosity. What about talent? You've each been given unique gifts and abilities. And those gifts and abilities are designed for more than just building careers. Our gifts and abilities aren't just in our lives to build careers. They're meant to build the kingdom. And one of the incredible things we can be generous with is with our talent, giving away the unique gifts that God has given us. And treasure, money, possessions, and resources. And I want to invite us, as we reflect and respond today, to think about all three. That we might be, and here's the reality. We live in a unique time. Lawrence mentioned this to me when we were chatting. He goes, some people in the midst of COVID might feel really pinched when it comes to treasure. But it doesn't mean you can't be generous in other areas. But the reality also is on the other side that there's sometimes we're comfortable being generous with one area, but very protected and closed off with another. And God's heart is that we would find our, our groups uh, loosening on all of those things. Okay, framework number one, three T's. Framework number two, three W's. <laughs> I think it's, for me, doing alliteration always feels a little bit awkward because I think, anyways, that's a side note. I'll sort out my own issues, not in public. Three W's. To be radically generous in a city like Vancouver is worship, it's warfare, and it's witness. It's worship, it's warfare, and it's witness. When you act against the tides of culture, by being generous with your time, your treasure, and your talent. It is worship, it is warfare, and it is witness. Very quickly, worship. When we're radically generous, it's worship. What is worship? It's response to God's goodness and grace. It's a declaration that God is God above all things. Sometimes in Christian literature, not just Christian literature, we talk about things as if they're gods. You can actually talk about money or time or talent as if they're gods. And that, might, that language might feel weird, but here's why it's actually very potent and powerful language. Because when we worship God above talent, treasure, and time, when we give those things as an act of worship, we're saying, God, you're more powerful and you're God above those things. But when we elevate those things above God, we take the worship that belongs to the one true God and we give it to something else. And obviously that can apply to lots of different things. And so it is very fitting that the things that want to steal worship from God would be the very things that we give in response to God's goodness in our life. When we give our time, our talent, and our treasure in the name of Jesus, remember it's worship. When you feel the pinch that you wanna hold back, say, no, I'm doing this because it's worship. Sometimes the cause is not enough to do it, but there's no cause more compelling than the worship of the living God. Number two, it's warfare. And I know this might sound like intense language, but I think it's fitting. There is a battle for the hearts of the people and the health of our city. There's a battle. And our call as the people of God is to push back darkness and to bring about in partnership with the work of God, his kingdom that is here and at hand, to partner with God in his kingdom making work. And the love of money is a principality in the city of Vancouver. It is actively influencing and manipulating people and systems at every layer of our city to work against the plans of God and to bring about destruction. And so how do we respond against principalities? What are our tools of warfare? We talked two weeks ago about prayer. Prayer is one of the ways that we respond. We pray together. This is why we're committed to being a people of prayer. And generosity is also an act of warfare. When we give open-handedly, we stand against the powers of this age that want to convince us towards selfishness and systems of self-seeking that bring about destruction. And so when we give, and when you feel that pinch that maybe to hold back, remember, it's worship and it's warfare. And last, it's witness. When we give, it is a witness to the fact that God has grabbed hold of our lives. 
The call of every Christian is to be a witness of the risen God who is good and loving and powerful and who's bringing his kingdom now and it's coming. I mean, this is what we testify to. We're witnesses of. This is the language of the New Testament. You are witnesses of the resurrected king and that he is alive and that his kingdom is good and his ways are right. And so when we live a generous life, we are speaking to others a testimony. We're witnessing to the risen God. And one thing that's incredibly powerful is that when we as a church get to be generous, and we got to do this through the week of generosity, giving to organizations, we are actively subverting the narratives that our culture might have against Christianity. And it's a powerful thing that even with our lives, when you live a generous life to your neighbors and your friends, and they might know you're a follower of Jesus, and there are negative narratives, this subverts that negative narrative. So our acts of generosity with our time, our treasure, and our talent is worship, It's warfare and it's a witness that God's love love has grabbed hold of our hearts. Two frameworks, three T's, three W's, and now, quickly, four ways that this will be expressed at the Way Church. Four ways that we'll live into this at the Way Church. First, at the Way Church, we will be radically generous in our giving to global missions and humanitarian work. We will be radically generous in our giving towards global missions and humanitarian work. We're always gonna do it. We're not gonna stop doing it. We've done it from the beginning. We're gonna partner with organizations and missionaries who are taking the gospel and meeting needs all over the world. There's a couple ways that we do this. One way is that every dollar that comes into the way church is offering, we take a percentage and we give it to this global work. We've got partner organizations that we've already partnered with doing work in different regions. And we have a fund that will grow over time that will allow us to respond, sometimes spontaneously and often very thoughtfully to key needs happening in our world. We wanna be deeply committed to this. In addition to that regular percentage, we're gonna do campaigns. You'll hear us in time and time inviting you in to supporting global missionaries and global partnerships. This summer, we're gonna do the Move for Freedom with Ally. And we're excited to invite our whole church to raise money and build teams for awareness and resource going towards their work. In just a few weeks, we get to send our first ever short-term missionaries out. We're gonna pray for them in a service. You're gonna hear more about what they're gonna do in Nepal over six months. And we're so excited to have a church who's radically generous in their expression towards global global missions and humanitarian work. Number two, at the way we'll be radically generous in our giving to respond to the needs of our city, especially the needs of poverty, injustice, homelessness, and those who are most on the margins. We feel called to be radically generous to the city that we're called to. And one of the primary ways we'll do that is by giving time, volunteer hours, and resources, money, other things, space, to organizations doing meaningful work in the city. Our strategy is not to start up a bunch of new works in the city, but to to find the organizations. We've already met a bunch of them who are doing incredible work to meet these needs. They've done the research, they've done the time, they've got the experience, and they've got the trust. And what we can bring, what they often say the number one needs we have is volunteers and resource to do it. And so as a church, we wanna be radically generous. So that's why every small group, the desire is that each small group would over time be able to cultivate a partnership with another organization in the city where you as a small group could volunteer together. And that's why, again, from all the resources that come in through the offerings, we give a percentage to our partner organizations. And then again, in key moments throughout the year, we're gonna do campaigns like the Week of Generosity. Just recently in November, we were able to give $36,000 to five organizations. It was incredible. And to be a young church, a brand new church in our first three months, it was an exciting step. But we look forward to the future. Over the next 50 years, God willing, as we're church here in this city, that we be able to give millions to the cause of this city. And as a result, we build deep partnerships. And while much could be said about churches in Vancouver, may it be said that they are radically in love with the people of the city caring for the practical needs expressed through time and generosity. You with me? It's exciting, isn't it? This is like, imagine, a tr- imagine what a generous church in Vancouver can do for global missions. Imagine what a generous church can do in a city like Vancouver. Okay, number three, we're gonna be radically generous as the way church, individually and together, as we build this local church and care for one another. As we build this local church and care for one another. 
I just want to take a moment and just express gratitude for those of you who have been regularly giving to the Way Church. It's powerful. It's an, I know, I know for, for you it's an act of worship, but it's also an act of stewardship. You're deciding where to put your resources towards. You're doing it as an act of worship to God, but also as an act of stewardship. And my heart is that, and what for Rach and I in our home, and I can say for the other staff and many of this church, we believe that local churches are the best investment for the flourishing of a city. It's the best place to put your resource. And what's incredible, and here's what I know, is that when you give to the Way Church, you're often funding uh, ministries and programs, disciple-making activities that might not even affect you directly. I think about how much we reinvest in kids' ministry because we long to see the next generation love and know Jesus and make a difference in their generation. It's an investment. Most of our congregation don't have kids, but as you give, you're giving to see others flourish. It's an incredible thing. Think about Alpha. We put real resources towards promoting and running Alpha because we want people far from God to have a safe place to explore faith and love and God. And for most of you, you're not benefiting from Alpha. But you're like, that's not the point. I'm investing and partnering with my people for the sake of making disciples here. It's an incredible thing we do and we want to grow in radical generosity that we can build a generous church with effective disciple-making impacts here in the city. And let me just say this, being generous in our local church goes beyond just giving to centralized programs through tithes and offerings. We see this again and again, even in small groups, as individuals take on the cause of others with their time, with their talent, and their treasure, overhearing the needs of someone else in our church community and saying, well, who else is gonna reach it? I'm gonna gather people together, we're gonna respond practically. We've seen that through gifts of money, through meal trains, through supporting others, it's been beautiful. And so this idea of being generous in our local church includes centralized giving and centralized programs and decentralized activities that no one knows about, but it brings about a healthy, vibrant church community. Okay, number four, we will be radically generous in our giving to other churches. We feel called to be a church that is for other churches. We are here today because of the generosity of Cherry Hills in Denver, King's Church in New Brunswick, Nova Church in Halifax, CLA in Langley, Calvary in Coquitlam, and North Langley Community Church. Churches that gave from their funding to support this church plant. And because they gave, we've been able to reach people in the city of Vancouver. We've been able to bring community to the city of Vancouver. We've been able to invite you into this space. What incredible thing they've done. And we feel called as a church to do the same. I feel like almost um, timid saying this, but I need us to get this. We are a church that is called to serve and encourage and equip other churches. Over the next decades, we feel called to plant or revitalize over 200 other churches. And we feel called to serve and support over 2,000 other churches. And it's already happening. Just in this last few months, our church has been able to help over 30 other churches, from preaching in their pulpits to providing worship, support for kids' ministry, Even our business team has helped other boards and congregations think through challenges in this time. Our production team has been on the phone or on Zoom coaching other people to be able to do what we do each week. It is baked into the core of who we are. We are a church that's designed to serve and love and support other churches. And as I walk through these four things, you can kind of see this growing vision that we'd be radically generous, first kind of in our own community with one another, and then radically generous in our city, concentric circles going out, and then in our nation through partnering with churches, then globally through missions and humanitarian work. Each time we've been chatting in this vision series, we've wanted to give you a practical next step. Uh, We talked about prayer the first week, and then we launched into the week of prayer. And we had over 15 prayer slots. We got to see many of you part of that. It was such a special week. And obviously, uh, a message on prayer involves more than just showing up at one of those prayer slots. It's a whole life. We wanted to give a practical step. When we talked about empowered community, one of the practical steps we gave was joining a small group or investing in your small group. And we've seen so many people step up in leadership in their small group. And over 10 new people sign up for small groups. I mean, we have over 200 people signed up for small groups at the Way Church. It's incredible. We talked about being passionate about introducing people to Jesus. And the practical next step was an invitation to Alpha, which launches next week. And so this week, as we talk about radical generosity, what might be the practical next step? I know that this has to infuse every part of our lives. But one of the practical next steps might be asking yourself, 
What might I do with my time, my talent, and my treasure to partner with my local church in this vision? So, in just a moment, we're going to worship and sing and turn our attention towards God. And in this time, I want to invite you to reflect and maybe to take a step of action in response to what we've talked about today. And lots might be said about possible actions, but there's two that come to mind. First is serving with your time and talent. Is there a team that you can serve on in our local church? This church happens, the work we're able to do. I jump on Kids Club and I see people volunteering a precious hour, four o'clock on a Wednesday to be able to serve and love kids. And at every corner of our church, you see people giving their precious time for the sake of worship and witness and warfare. And I wanna invite you to serve. It's really easy to do it. You can find the link online. And I wanna invite you to give, to give regularly, to set up regular giving as a response to what, you are, what God's doing in your life and the desire to help build the local church here in this city. I wanna invite you to take time right now just to reflect, how might I open up my life with my time, my talent, and my treasure to live into this call to radical generosity, which is a testimony of the radical generosity of Jesus. Here's what I'm noticing. We live in a city and a world that moves towards how much can I accumulate and how can I take more for myself? But we, as followers of Jesus, set our eyes not on the world, but on Jesus, who the trajectory of his whole life was to empty himself. And the beautiful picture that we see is as Jesus emptied himself and sowed his life like a seed, the result is so much life and fruit. I think about the language of Paul that says, I want to join Christ like in his crucifixion. Like I want to lay down my life too. And I feel like that's what this is a call to, to make this just about money, just about tithe, just about giving, just about volunteering would miss the point. This is about emptying ourselves after the example of Christ that life would grow in and around us in Jesus' name.